The National Catholic Broadcasting Council, through the kindness of our donors, invites you to join us as we reflect on the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Please welcome our host, Deacon Mike Walsh. On Good Friday around the world, the Catholic faithful gather in churches where the tabernacle is empty. The Blessed Sacrament has been moved to the altar of repose. The empty tabernacle reminds us that Jesus has handed himself over to those who have come to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mass will not be celebrated again in the church until the Easter Vigil, where the empty tabernacle will once again be filled with the Blessed Sacrament. Today we will join together to read, reflect, and pray as we enter into the passion and death of Jesus according to the Gospel of John. Father Michael Kutz will be our spiritual guide through the story of our Lord's suffering. We begin with a question. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you Each year, our Good Friday reading is taken from the Gospel according to John. In the Passion story, Matthew, Mark, and Luke stress the humanity of Jesus. John, however, highlights the divinity. As a result, in the Passion of Jesus according to John, you will not hear these words, let this chalice pass me by. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, we call it the passion of our Lord. Passion involves suffering, and the greatest suffering that we have is when we cannot do what we will, what we choose, and what we desire. Jesus gives up this very choice. Jesus undertakes the passion because he was obedient to the Father, obedient even unto death, death on the cross, obedient until he can say, it is accomplished. Like Jesus, we suffer little deaths constantly. In Spanish, they call it mordita. Parents stay awake through the night with a sick child, and yet they do not quit working in the morning with a boss who bullies or an employee who is rude. And they reach out in love and care when they see a need. It is a constant passion in many senses of the word. Jesus knew that the passion, suffering, and death was not the end. I lay down my life to pick it up again. Jesus invites you and me into that same understanding and knowledge. I call you friends, he said. I make known to you the Father's love. With the sure hope of this blessed assurance that Jesus calls us his friends, we now enter into the Passion of Christ according to John. After they had eaten the supper, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. 
Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was a father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. At that moment, the cock crowed. Jesus knew that Judas was set to betray him. Jesus, however, loved him so much that he preempted the betrayal. He approached the guards before Judas would kiss him. Peter did not betray, but he denied. He had boasted, if others deny you, I will not. We see his denial in neon lights. I do not know the man. Yet Jesus gives Peter the keys of the kingdom. Furthermore, Peter is entrusted to feed, nourish, and care for the sheep. Jesus' love is seen in those who fall, but then get up and continue to follow him. Jesus knows all that is to happen. Through the ages, he will see betrayals and denials at some time in each of our lives, but Jesus is faithful in love. He knows that parents and grandparents, single Christians and the religious desire the best for the sheep entrusted to them. They are in anguish when children do not practice the faith, when children seek their identity in bigger salaries, bigger houses, and bigger cars, when children are too busy to visit, to phone, or even show they care. But Jesus also knows that these same parents and grandparents have also witnessed the resurrection in that suffering, when children show their gratitude, when children reach out to the poor and needy, when children are caring. 
Jesus knows this in the same way as he knew what would happen in Gethsemane, in the house of Caiaphas, in the palace of Pilate. Jesus said yes to the Father's will and will help us to do the same. We now journey with Jesus as he is handed over to Pilate. During their encounter, Jesus tells this representative of the state, you have no power over me, as Jesus prepares himself to drink the cup of his passion and death. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. They replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are a king. You say that I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here, is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you 
and power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. Jesus is totally in control. In this knowledge and conviction, Jesus could tell Pilate, you have no power over me unless it has been given to you. We are told Pilate grew frightened, and rightly so. God has given us the free will to accept the Word made flesh. To those who accept the Word, they will have the power to be called children of God. We can refuse, and we have refused, but God will never take away our free will to make a choice. Nevertheless, the all-wise and almighty God has found a way for our salvation and redemption, even when we have been deaf, dumb, and closed our hearts to the Word of God. We have this extraordinary scene of Jesus and Pilate. Jesus has been scourged, He has a crown of thorns. He is weak, and yet he is in charge. Pilate says, Ecce homo, behold the man. But our gaze is not on Jesus, but on Pilate. He is less than a man. He gives way to the crowd. When we know that we are loved by God, supported by family and friends, when we are strengthened in our faith, we can handle anything. Psalm 22, verse 6 says, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by humankind and despised by the people. Jesus looked like that, was scorned by humankind and despised by the people. Sometimes we feel like that. But God has given us the grace, the skill, and the talent to face the reality of this world. Alone, we may not be able to do it, but with faith in Christ, we can handle anything. The story of the Passion continues as we experience Jesus being falsely judged and turned over to be crucified. We stand at the foot of the cross with Mary, and together we witness his death and burial. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the Place of the Skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Many of the people read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what Scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, in order to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies to be left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled, none of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred weight. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. It was a patriarchal society. It is remarkable the number of women who played a large role in the ministry of Jesus. By the cross, we find three women. One of those standing by Jesus is Mary, the mother of Jesus. To stand by a person meant you bore witness to them, you cared for them, you made yourself responsible for their life and action. 
Mary stood at the foot of the cross as a loving mother, but also as a disciple par excellence of Jesus. She witnessed to the fact that Jesus was obedient unto death, death on a cross. Jesus hands over to Mary, our church. Jesus says, Behold your son, fittingly called the unnamed disciple. We are the unnamed disciple. Mary stands by the cross. She stands for all mothers and wives and sisters and religious to whom the church was entrusted as well. Mary wants so badly to help Jesus on the cross, but she cannot. Women through the ages have felt the same, sometimes due to culture, tradition, and customs, sometimes due to stubbornness on the part of others, they will not be permitted. In Mary, there is no bitterness or complaint. Mary ponders these things in her heart and continued to do the work for caring for the body of Christ, you and me. From that hour, the disciple whom Jesus loved took her into his home. Like the unnamed disciple, we cannot do any better than to take Mary into our home and our hearts. We do this in the way we treat women and men around us. We take them into our home, we care for them, and we are concerned about them. The words of Andrew Lloyd Webber in his song, Love Changes Everything, reminds us that Jesus gives us the greatest gift through his passion and death, which will soon be completed with his resurrection. And the, our Lord shows us that love changes everything. Love, love changes everything, hands and faces, earth and sky. Love, love changes everything, how you live, and how you die. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Join us in this prayer of adoration. We adore your cross, O Lord. We praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For behold, because of the wood of a tree, joy has come to the whole world. May God have mercy on us and bless us. May he let his face shed its light upon us and have mercy on us. Bow your heads for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>